Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you are in the world today. Welcome to this webinar introducing the Oxford Principles for Net Zero Aligned Carbon Offsetting. Uh, my name is Ben Caldicott. I direct the Oxford Sustainable Finance Programme. I'm one of the co-authors of the principles. Um, and clearly among the co-authors, I seem to have drawn the short straw. Um, and so I'm going to be chairing uh, today's event, trying to moderate, uh, and you'll be hearing from all, all the wonderful co-authors. Um, we've seen net zero pledges from many companies, um, and there have been so many recent significant examples, for example, BP and Google. Um, we've also seen significant net zero commitments from countries. Um, but what types of offsets, offsets are acceptable, and under what conditions should they be used? These are the two central questions um, we explore in the principles, and we're also going to explore them today as we introduce them to you. Uh, the event has three parts. So the first part you're going to hear from um, Dr. Steve Smith, who's uh, the project manager for the Greenhouse Gas Removal Hub based at the Smith School of Enterprise and Environment, um, as well as uh, Eli Mitchell Larson, who's a PhD candidate at the Environmental Change Institute. They're going to introduce the principles. So we've got about 15 minutes of a presentation and then some Q&A about the presentation. The second part is going to be a Q&A with some of the authors. So we have um, three authors who are going to be participating there. Originally, we had four, four down. So we've got Professor Miles Allen, who's Professor of Geosystem Science. Many of you will know Miles. Um, Kaya Axelson, who's the Net Zero Policy Engagement Fellow, was down, but had to withdraw at the last minute due to illness. So apologies that she won't be here. Um, we also have Dr. Thomas Hale, who's Associate Professor in Public Policy at the Blavatnik School of Government. And we have um, Professor Yadvinda Mali, who's Professor of Ecosystem Science at the Environmental Change Institute. So we've got about 20 or so minutes for moderated Q&A. And then the final part is a panel discussion with four climate leaders. Um, we have Jess Ayres, who's Director of uh, Climate at the Children's Investment Fund Foundation. We have Margaret Kulo, who is the Global Finance Practice Leader for WWF International. We have Miguel Naranjo, who is the Climate Neutral Now Lead at the UNFCCC. And finally, we have Lewis Redshaw, who's the CEO and founder of Redshaw Advisors. Um, now, we want this to be as interactive as possible. Um, there are lots of you, which is fantastic. Uh, hopefully, more will jo join as well. Um, so please do ask questions, even from the very beginning. Please put them into the, the Q&A function um, in Zoom, and I will I'll have a look and keep an eye on them. And I'll do my best to channel as many of those questions to our very distinguished uh, set of speakers today. Um, I should also say uh, the event's being recorded and um, will be made available shortly after we finish. And that means obviously all of this will be able to reach a much wider audience. Um, so without further ado, over to Steve and Eli. Thank you, Ben, and good morning, afternoon, evening to everyone who's attending. Thank you so much. Uh, so uh, Ben already touched a little bit, and, and I think we have some slides that are coming up in just a moment. Uh, so Ben touched a little bit on the motivations that inspired uh, the Oxford uh, principles for net zero aligned offsetting. And uh, the, the thing to really harp on here, so of course there's the sort of proliferation of net zero targets. There's also the some sort of select industry initiatives like Corsia. There's the ongoing questions about article six and how that's gonna impact on the voluntary carbon markets. And there's also the Mark Carney led task force for scaling voluntary carbon markets, which might come up a bit later. And the only other thing to mention is just, <clears throat> well, I think we're always tempted to, to uh, 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 sort of shorten the title of the, of the report to just the Oxford Offsetting Principles, but it's really helpful to use the full title, the Oxford Principles for Net Zero Aligned Carbon Offsetting, because you'll hear that come up a lot today. The fact that what we're talking about is a specific use case of offsets, which is using them in support of making a net zero emissions claim. Um, so moving on, we're gonna go through just the four principles really briefly. Um, principle one, is it's the, it's the principle that's not that new. It's sort of essentially our point of departure, but it is important to sort of go through the, the, uh, the key best practices that already exist around carbon offsetting. And so there's kind of three parts to that that we highlighted in, in the report. The first is prioritize, prioritizing reducing one's own emissions and minimizing the need to use offsets in the first place. So this is sometimes referred to as a mitigation hierarchy. The idea that you really should be reducing all emissions you possibly can. That's gonna differ for every industry, of course, but generally speaking, you can often think of it as the hard to abate emissions. That's the, the emissions that come from sectors of the economy that are hard to abate. Maybe that's uh, long haul aviation or cement production. 
it, of course it varies by industry, but th those are the things that are potentially gonna be permissible to offset in a net zero context. Um, and there's many tools and organizations already out there, um, uh, many of whom are represented in the audience today, uh, that can help different industries think about how to reduce their own emissions and, and scale up their own removals. And so we point to those initiatives and we mention those uh, in the document. Um, the second piece is around using high quality offsets. Uh, sorry, um, still on that slide there. Uh, so here uh, we're talking about the sort of laundry list that you often hear that offsets of course must be additional. They must be verifiable. They must be correctly accounted for. They must be permanent and they must do no harm. And there's also, there's other elements to that as well. Um, and we did that not to just repeat what other excellent off guide, uh, offsetting guides have, have provided and, and gone into more detail, but really just to highlight that, that all of these things need attention and that the, the intent of a carbon credit or an, off, or an offset is to ensure a real atmospheric impact, whether that's a reduction in CO2 emissions or a removal of CO2 from the atmosphere. If that's not happening, it's not going to fit uh, appropriately into a net zero alliance strategy. So just to go through those really briefly. So of course, additional means that the, the reduction or removal happened because of the offset transaction, not something that wouldn't, ha wouldn't have happened anyways. And I think additionality is something that gets talked about a lot, but what often gets miss missed is that additionality is both a test at the beginning of the carbon project, and it's something that has to be assessed on an ongoing basis and into the future. Because what was additional five years ago, two years ago, one year ago, may no longer be additional today. The second piece is around uh, verifiability and correct accounting. And that just means a ton of CO2 uh, is actually stored or uh, removed, reduced, and stored uh, for each offset. And then another piece, which we'll come to in more detail later, is for, for some activities where you're just avoiding emissions, permanence really just means that the uh, activity is, that the, that the avoidance is permanent and that it doesn't, uh, it isn't undermined subsequently. But a lot of reductions and removals actually involve carbon storage. That is, after the, uh, the activity is performed, the carbon is stored. And so in that case, permanence means the risk that it's reversed from that storage. Uh, and, and finally, do no harm is really just talking about all of the negative consequences beyond, that could occur, making sure none of them do. Um, and I think just a final point of emphasis, when we, when we put this uh, element of quality offsetting in here, we, we really hope it's not read as business as usual. In other words, you've heard all of these characteristics of offsets before, and I think our point is that you know, many of the offsets, perhaps even most that are available today might not pass a strict reading of principle one. And I think a strict reading of principle one is probably what's most appropriate in the net zero context. Um, and the very final piece is about disclosure and that's about reporting the accounting practices that you use to uh, measure scope one, two and three emissions and also the, the way that you're exchanging between non-CO2 pollutants and CO2 equivalent when you're accounting for offsets. And the final piece of disclosure is actually disclosed, and this is the piece that I don't think is, we don't think is as mature in the market, is really disclosing what kinds of offsets you're using. And that's why one of the first things we, we attempted to do with the principles was present a taxonomy that you'll see in the document that walks you through the different buckets of offsets that we sort of delineated. And there could be other taxonomies as well, but the important thing is there needs to be a consistent taxonomy that the voluntary carbon market coalesces around and users of offsets needs, need to report not just the typical greenhouse gas protocol elements of what emissions they have, but also which offsets they're using to address those. So moving on to principle two and, and drawing on that taxonomy, principle two, uh, this is where things start to get a bit uh, newer and, and perhaps that you haven't heard as many times before. Um, and here, what we're talking about is that uh, most offsets today derive from activities that are emission reduction. That is, there's an existing emission source, a baseline is established, and then emissions are reduced relative to that baseline. But of course, and I should add that often this distinction between removals, which is when you're actually taking CO2 out of the atmosphere, and reductions, which I just described, is often opaque. It's not always clear when an offset is being marketed. Is it a reduction or is it a removal? So that's something that we think needs to be clarified. Um, now, what we're saying here is not that the transition has to happen immediately. So the, the transition to, to carbon removal is something that uh, is going to be gradual because it's, it's neither necessary nor feasible to go straight to removals from day one. But what we're saying here is that in order to achieve a real enduring net zero emission state, eventually carbon removal, uh, or, or rather eventually residual emissions 
anything that's left over will have to be balanced by, by uh, removals. And this is the idea of balancing sources and sinks. So it's a destination to aim for. It's not something that has, has to happen immediately, but it's something we all have to agree on that in net zero aligned offsetting, the offsets we use will have to increasingly come from uh, carbon removal opportunities. There's many ways to remove carbon from the air. Of course, there's uh, planting and growing trees and other uh, biological solutions. There's soil carbon enhancement. And then there's some more sort of nascent technological solutions like direct air uh, capture and storage uh, and bio biomass with carbon capture, sometimes referred to as BECs. Uh, so users of offsets have to effectively increase the portion of offsets that they're using that are removals over time. Uh, but of course, this reduction removal distinction is just one distinction. And so other distinctions exist as well. And that's what uh, where I'll hand it over to my colleague, Dr. Steve Smith, uh, to continue with principles three and four. Thank you, Eli. And hello, everybody. Uh, yes, so principle three is shift offsetting towards long lived storage, uh, which complements principle two about switching towards removal. And the reason we talk about this is because there is an additional facet to carbon removal technologies and actually to emission reduction technologies which capture carbon and store it, which is where the carbon actually gets stored. So if you think of uh, carbon storage in forests and soils, that's a biological form of carbon storage. Alternatively, uh, we think of uh, carbon capture and storage and usually that's uh, putting the CO2 underground in say depleted oil and gas reservoirs or aquifers. So that's underground storage. Another form of carbon storage is, of course, when you mineralize it, so you chemically bind it up in rock. And these have different features in terms of um, how long lived or, or how reversible that carbon storage is. We wrote long lived and short lived in the document, but actually it's probably better described or characterized as low risk of reversal and high risk of reversal. That's what we're really interested in. So short lived uh, storage here refers to methods of storing carbon which have an uncertain or a higher risk of being reversed potentially on the timescale of decades. So relevant to, to the timescale over which we're trying to get to net zero and manage the climate. Um, if poorly managed, uh, biological storage methods in particular can be easily reversed. Trees can be chopped down, uh, soil management can be halted, and then the, the CO2 leaks back out of the soils, re-releasing carbon into the air. Now, if managed well, uh, these are capable of storing carbon for much longer, even for millennia. Uh, but even then, um, we expect climate change itself actually to add to the risk of biological carbon stores through fire and disease, for instance. So longer lived storage um, or methods which have a lower risk of reversal um, tend to be stable uh, or lower risk over centuries or millennia even. Um, this includes storing CO2 in geological reservoirs or mineralizing the carbon into stable forms. Now, of course, it is possible to do that badly. It's possible to leak carbon out of a reservoir and robust monitoring and verification is still gonna be needed to ensure that doesn't happen. But generally we can characterize these uh, stores as much more inert and secure. Now, the activities which do offer this long lived irreversible carbon removal are generally actually at an early stage of development and only running at small scales and, and actually expensive. So uh, some examples that um, Eli gave earlier that fit into this category are direct air capture with carbon capture and storage, DAX, or enhanced weathering, or other forms of mineralization. But crucially, we're not being technology prescriptive here. The key attribute we are highlighting is that uh, we're interested in techniques that can remove carbon with a very low risk of reversal. So we need to start scaling and improving these approaches now in order to realize this shift over the coming decades to 2050, if we're gonna meet the Paris Agreement globally. And principle four then looks at how do we get from here to there? Thank you. So principle four, support the development of net zero aligned offsetting. Um, what actions can buyers and sellers of offsets take now to support net zero aligned offsetting? Well, here are some suggestions. Number one and number two, setting up long-term agreements and alliances to aggregate supply and demand. So now that we see this proliferation of net zero targets around the world at a variety of levels, cities, states, uh, countries, companies, um, there's an increasing number of entities who are willing to pay to offset responsibly. And there are an increasing number of startups and ideas for long-term carbon removal, or carbon removal in general, looking for finance. But it's hard for the two to meet at the moment. 
So users could individually or collectively enter into long-term purchase agreements to provide price certainty for those projects which can make a difference, for instance. Also, each type of industry, business and organisation has its own characteristics in terms of where its emissions come from and what they can do. Uh, different levels of so-called hard to abate uh, emissions, as Eli touched on. So users in these sectors can form partnerships to leverage shared opportunities and advocate in their industry bodies. Um, the next point um, is support nature preservation and restoration in its own right. Now, uh, one thing we really don't want to give the impression is that we're saying you need to stop doing short-lived carbon removal, meaning all forestry and soils and nature-based biological projects. Um, we think actually they should be scaled up. Um, even though carbon storage in nature can be reversed, there is a carbon benefit, a real carbon benefit to good projects. And there are many other reasons, of course, to, to support nature too. Um, but I guess we would make uh, two observations. Number one is that th these many benefits shouldn't be conflated when judging these activities on their carbon merits for the benefit of, for the purpose of financing through carbon offsetting specifically. And the other po point for observation we would make is um, very importantly, nature-based offsetting is not a one-to-one -one substitute for continued fossil fuel emissions in the long run. Um, finally, adopt and publicize these principles. Um, as Eli said, even principle one on best practice, our kind of point of departure and, and the very good information that's out there, sadly is not universally true for offsets and offset strategies. And principles two and three are not widely recognized, we think. So sending that signal helps to create the demand. Um, and move uh, help streamline this and incorporate it into regulations and standards. Now, there's already a range of standards governing both offsets and the definition of net zero. And it's not our aim as the University of Oxford to create and operationalize a new standard. So Eli has sent around an XKCD cartoon, which is very apt. Uh, someone saying, hey, look at this mess of X different standards for this product. Let's create the single best standard to replace them all. And of course, what you end up with is X plus one standards. So that's not what we're trying to do. But our hope is that the standards out there do over time evolve to reflect these principles that we've set out. So we're at a critical juncture in climate action and the future of carbon offsets within that. And we hope that these Oxford principles help push us forward to a net zero sustainable world. And uh, we hope that's been a helpful summary. I'll hand back to Ben now. Great. Well, thanks so much, guys. So if you can stick around and if I could invite uh, Miles, Yadvinda, Kaya and Tom to join us. We will now have a QA. and a um, and we've got a whole bunch of questions, so thank you, keep them coming. Um, but the first question I want to, to pass to one of my colleagues is, is kind of Mike's question, actually, and this is around biomass, and I wanted um, to hand this over to Yadvinda in the first instance. Yadvinda, are you able to have a crack? Okay, uh, let's just look at the question there. This is about uh, leakage. Uh, okay, uh, right. Uh, I just just to introduce myself as well. I'm um, uh, Jan yeah, my professor of ecosystem science uh, in the School of Geography and the Environment uh, uh, and the Environmental Change Institute, and particularly have an angle on the nature-based solutions uh, 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 points uh, in there as well. And uh, perhaps before I answering my specific point, I think broadly what we see in these principles is that nature-based solutions can pay play a short term role in, in, in aligning towards net zero pathways and in particular in many ways are, are quite scalable uh, as well while the other technologies get ready, while there are ultimate limits to nature based solutions when we're looking towards the later half of this century and the need to shift to these to these other uh, other longer lived uh, uh, and lower risk uh, uh, supply things. And I think within nature based solutions there's a whole range of of issues. One that Mike mentions there is around leakage. I think certainly that is true, particularly in the area of avoided emissions. I think avoided deforestation, where the fundamental economic drivers uh, mean that if you slow it down somewhere else, you may be increasing it somewhere else. I think restoration projects tend to have less issues around leakage in the same way because the economic drivers and land use are a bit more diffuse there. But scale is often one way of tackling leakage as well. And if you're if you're working at, a, at an integrated way on a larger scale, the leakage issues tend to be smaller than if you're working at the scale of, of micro projects. That's up there. 
Great, thanks, Yudvinda. Does anyone else want to come in on um, nature-based solutions, leakage, permanence, those sorts of questions from the co-author group? Um, yeah, if I may, um, I, I think the one sort of macro leakage worry that I have um, are, and it goes back to the sort of argument for net zero right back at the outset when it was recognized that um, the capacity of the biosphere um, to take up carbon was was limited and declining, um, which is why we end up with this linear relationship between cumulative carbon emissions and uh, global temperatures and why we need to get to net zero CO2 emissions in the first place. Um, so, and, and, and the reason it's declining, I, I'm not a carbon cycle modeler, but so the carbon cycle modelers tell us is that there's a risk of many um, biospheric carbon sinks uh, turning into sources over the course of the century as a result of warming itself. Um, and so I think th this, this introduces a sort of macro level risk. And, and I agree, and I, you know, we've been discussing it amongst ourselves quite a bit, you know, is this a risk? Is it a risk we need to worry about? How much do we need to worry about it? Some people worry about it a lot. Um, others are more sanguine. Um, but, you know, the, the, the key point is, if leakage is induced by climate change itself, not by the fault of you know any management of the of the uh, of the offset uh, uh, of, of the of the of the forest or the peatland or the tundra or whatever it has been used uh, to store carbon, um, then it's it's quite tricky to see who's responsible for that, and 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 that's that's what that's what makes this a particularly tricky risk to handle. Mm. Just to respond to that, there's two different uses of the word leakage here. I think uh, Mike's question was about project-based leakage of- Yes, sorry, I, yeah, I yeah, no, you're right. Uh, yeah, okay, I just thought, okay. Thanks, Yvonne. So one other set of questions that seems to be coming up from the audience, actually, your questions, I'm gonna to divert to Tom Hale, um, and, and it's really around, quite, well, one, governance, but two, also, you know, how, how, how all these things be used um, and how should corporations or financial institutions or, or others um, sign up to these principles? Is, is that something we're planning to do? Tom, you're very involved in things like Race to Zero as part of the UNFCCC and the champions. Maybe you could say something about, about that. Happily. So um, great question. I see in the chat people have asked, where do I sign up? Which is a, a great question to ask. We as Oxford University will not be offering a sign up sheet to everyone, but we do, of course, really hope that people will be developing offsetting um, practices, approaches, and as Ben mentioned, critically, governance standards and regulations that draw on these principles and incorporate them into their practice. Um, and just to reinforce one thing, Steve said, you know, we're seeing so many net zero targets all around the world. It's going to be a big summit on Saturday celebrating the fifth anniversary of the climate change agreement in Paris. Um, that will have even more net zero announcements to, for the world to behold. Um, what we we're finding that, though is that many of these net zero announcements aren't very clear on the question of how offsetting fits into those pathways. And so having a, uh, some understanding of that and indeed some standards around that is going to be really critical for making the net zero targets stick. Um, and just to give it one further you know, set of ideas on where that's happening, there's a huge uh, set of sort of both private and public standards being developed on both offsetting and on net zero. So on the offsetting side, of course, you know, Eli mentioned a few of them, um, there's big political debates around Article 6 in the Paris Agreement, but also this is a, an important debate in um, a number of countries considering their own emissions trading schemes and, and whatnot. On the net zero side, we're seeing net zero standards being developed by the International Organization for Standardization, by uh, private bodies like um, different industry groups, by UN bodies like the Race to Zero campaign, by countries like France. Um, and so we're having a huge amount of, of work in the regulatory space, and that regulatory space needs to be informed by science to be able to help deliver the goals of the Paris Agreement. So these principles we're putting out into the world as a hope to inform all those conversations and make sure that they're converging upward toward where they need to be. Great, thanks, Tom. Um, so we've had uh, a couple of questions around, again, nature, and we had one from Henry Grubb around additionality double counting with nature and carbon. Is there, Yadvinda, do you want to come in on that? Is there a risk of double counting? Sorry, I can't see the specific question there, but- uh, So, uh, it, yeah, it's a, it's a, I guess it's a question around um, multiple outcomes associated with offsets, 
biodiversity outcomes, carbon outcomes? Is that is that helpful? Is that confusing? I think uh, the additional outcomes add value. So any uh, any biosphere carbon value that, that is used to offset uh, fossil fuel emissions is, is the direct climate mitigation goal that the officer should pay for. But if there are co-benefits that come in in terms of biodiversity, uh, uh, livelihoods, uh, sustainable development, so climate change adaptation, I think there are extra bonuses that make those green carbon uh, issues extra valuable. But, but of course, as was pointed out earlier, we shouldn't allow them to, to displace the, the, in terms of carbon offsetting and the fundamental carbon value uh, that, that drives that. Great, thank you, Linda. Um, there's another question here from Carlotta. Um, is there research to, that evaluates the appetite for offsets, particularly amongst individuals? I'm thinking about citizen engagement. Maybe Tom, have you seen anything on, on this or Stephen, Eli? So I think from, from individuals, there's certainly um, some interest in the voluntary carbon market of people trying to um, balance out their sources and sinks on a household level. Um, I think though that we're seeing as, as Eli mentioned, really a big demand for a kind of new category of offsets that are gonna actually be part of a credible pathway to organizations that are, are trying to demonstrate that they're responding to the massive societal demand we see for um, credible climate targets. And you know, I think a number of people saying what they think they should say is no longer enough. People are demanding to see evidence, to see progress, and there's actually a huge amount of suspicion, not necessarily unfounded. Um, and so I think businesses are going to find, and are finding, that they're really hungry for kind of a credible thing that they can do to get that stamp of approval. Um, and I think these will, are hopefully going to help people um, develop those. Um, and, and here I think the the risk that businesses face is that. Um, you know, the, the offsetting market, voluntary offsetting market certainly has not had its, not been immune from problems over the years. As we see more social demand for credibility, those problems are only going to become greater business risks. And so high, high quality regulation is actually going to really help leaders to be able to um, preserve their social license to operate in a challenging context. I could just come in on that as well, Ben, if that's all right. Um, yeah, I think there has been a proliferation both on the B2C, so business to consumer side and the B2B businesses going net zero. And on the B2C side, it's almost like, you know, people in, in venture capital will tell you there's a new platform popping up every week. And the problem with a lot of those platforms is they're, they're going directly to the consumer who doesn't have, you know, a sustainability team who can tell them, you know, here's the quality metrics you need to look for for offsets. So it's really just people that are saying, oh shoot, I wanna travel home for Christmas and I need to offset my flight, what should I do? And that's a space where we're seeing, I think a lot of repeats of the kind of low quality offsetting that, that plagued uh, the last couple of decades. Um, in terms of on the corporate side, you know, right now the voluntary market is 100 million tons of CO2, 100 megatons. And I think the interesting thing is everybody wants to scale it, or at least, you know, you look at the name of the Carney Task Force for Scaling Voluntary Carbon Markets, it has the word scaling right in it. And I think, you know, there was an FT article where they said it needs to be a hundred billion dollar market. And there's two ways of looking at that. One is, yes, of course, we, we need this massive market. The other way of looking at it is, well, if the only offset that, that corporates are willing to buy at scale is an offset that doesn't deliver real climate benefits, that's not a product we would want to scale. The, the flip side of that is to say, in order to scale in a sustainable way, we need to ensure quality, otherwise we're scaling nothing. So for me, I think the key is what we want to be scaling is climate mitigation. That's our North Star. If carbon offsetting, if voluntary carbon markets can be a vehicle that get us in that direction, great. But we need to be cautious that we don't mix up the goals and, and make you know, volumes of transaction in the secondary, carbon, the secondary market for offsets the uh, metric that we're optimizing for. Yeah, great, great point, Eli. And I know that the... Um the author group is submitting a consultation response to the TSVCM that will be made public probably tomorrow. Um, so if you're interested in that, watch this space. There's a specific question. I think this is this must be for Miles um, from John Ventress. How far advanced is the technology around mineralization and on what scale could it be used? Um, okay, I was just typing into the um, uh, chat, but um, uh, I think the, 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 the catch with mineralization, although it looks very attractive in principle, um, is that it's very um, uh, application, it's, it's very sort of project specific. Um, and, you know, the key thing we're going to need to know is, quant is, 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 is methods of quantifying 
the, gen, the, the, the true net carbon benefits of mineralization projects. Um, and again, it, it's exactly the kind of technology that would benefit from a, uh, a sort of clear mandate um, on or clear sort of um, incentive for offset purchasers to be to be looking for durable storage, um, and and that 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 might then press those who are developing uh, mineralization to prove that that what they're offering is a durable and affordable form of carbon capture and storage, um, and uh, then then you know that they they would they would create a sort of market for precisely what they're trying to do. If I can just pick up on that briefly. Um, a couple of interesting projects, by no means the only ones, but ones to look out for if, if you're interested in the topic. One is Project Vesta, which is one of the ones that's being funded by Stripe, which you may know is a company that's been quite forward thinking in funding removals, which is essentially looking at applying certain minerals on a beach where the CO2 is naturally absorbed and, and, and mineralized that way. Another project, and this is a very different one, uh, is is taking a direct air capture machine in Iceland uh, built by Climaworks and uh, hooking it up to CarbFix, which is a process which puts the capture CO2 from the air into basalt where it mineralizes very quickly. Um, there are other people looking, for instance, at um, taking alkaline industrial wastes from mines, from cement plants, from steelworks, and soaking up the CO2 using that waste. So that's just to give you an indication that there, there are a few projects out there yeah, they're really quite diverse and I think it's, I think mineralization is one particular area where there's a lot of scope for innovation and for some novel solutions. They're generally at an early stage so I think we can't bank on them in the near term um, but I think I want to look at look at nicely because um, they they offer a complement to carbon capture and storage which as we know has had a fairly, lo fairly long and storied uh, history of trying to get up and running at scale you don't need those pipelines to do mineralization and yet you still get long-lived storage. But if I could just comment, because I'm sort of uh, known to be an enthusiast for geological storage, of course, you, we, we need to be doing this in order to assess the risks. And the crucial point is risk of reversal uh, while you know, reacting carbon dioxide with rocks underneath Iceland sounds like a splendid idea until you think about the fact that Iceland is highly volcanically active. Um, exactly what is the risk of reversal there? Um, interesting, you know, point to quantify. I don't know what the answer is, but but we should be thinking about it for all of these um, car long term carbon storage options. So, so I mean, that's a that's a point that Stuart Hazeldine from Edinburgh is making. Um, you know, what what is the acceptable level level of risk, whether that's for uh, physical leakage or for permanent in ecological systems? Do, do you does does anyone want to try and answer that, or is or is the answer we need to do more work? I, I always hate that answer. So um, again, and, and coming back to an earlier question about principles versus targets, I think we need, you know, we, you need to agree principles first in order to, to set your targets. Um, and the basic principle is that if you're burning fossil carbon, you're having a permanent impact on the climate system because you're releasing stuff that's been stashed away for millions of years. Um, and, and therefore, in effect, you have a responsibility, you know, by permanent, um, permanent storage needs to mean, you know, potentially thousands of years, because that's the sort of time frame over which um, the impact of fossil carbon will continue to affect the climate system. Um, which means, of course, that if you're doing this, you are, you are implicitly taking on a you know, taking on responsibility for something that that's, uh, that needs to be stored for a very, very long time. And if it does leak back out again, in principle, again, it's back to principles rather than specific targets here, um, you, you should have some kind of obligation to put it back. Finder, did you want to come in as well? Yeah. Response to that. So I'd have a slightly different perspective on that. And I'd say the, the fundamental challenge we face is over the next half century or no of reaching peak, temp peak temperatures and going down. And, uh, uh, and if we haven't solved the fundamental fossil fuel emission problem in a century time, we're really in, we're in really big trouble. So I think the, to me, the permanence issue is, is most important on the, on the time scale of this century and maybe this half century to come. And you know, we need to make sure anything we do now stays in the ground and doesn't reverse at this time of carbon cycle crisis. Uh, if we start seeing problems occurring next century, for example, we're going to be in a very different technological and political world and, and things. And I think 
it's perhaps adding too much of a burden to say that things need to be in there for sure for centuries and then and, and, and the scale of human history. But I think uh, if we can tackle it on the time scale of a half century and, and get a short permanence or low risk or high probability of permanence at that scale, I think that that's a meaningful sort of scale. For me to Look, think about. If it's if I said a thousand years and we compromise on half century on 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 a century or two, I mean you know yes, but it's it's a it's a lot longer than certainly the duration of many um, uh, current uh, offsetting projects. And that's that's the crucial point. So uh, one question um, from Robbie. I'm going to direct this at Tom, um, Robbie Watt, about the interaction between voluntary carbon markets and Article 6 and the UNFCCC process. Could you answer that? Great question. Um, so the short answer is it depends, which is not a very satisfying one. But um, Article 6 is the, the, the grounds of debate there are really on what nation states can claim credit for or not in their own commitments under Paris, which are defined voluntarily. Can they claim credit for things that maybe others could also be claiming in their NDCs or not? Um, and so the relation to the voluntary credit market is, is not particularly tight on a direct level. But if you saw a system where Article 6 were, were resolved in a way that had a very kind of loose standard, that put downward pressure, I think, on the voluntary carbon market because you'd be having a lot of claims about what counted or not um, being seen as credible in the UN space because it had a weak standard. And that might, um, you know, be, to my mind, be a risk of the voluntary credit market because you have um, uh, no need to, uh, you know, the, the banner of the UN could be used to defend things that we probably wouldn't think of as aligned with the scientific reality. The other point, though, that's important is that the Article 6 interaction with the net zero component is particularly important. A lot of countries have adopted or intended to adopt net zero targets. Um, they don't say very much about how they might be looking outside their own borders to help them with those, with those targets. The UK, for example, has sort of reserved its, uh, the right to um, think about that in the future, hasn't closed off that possibility. Other countries have. If everyone's thinking about doing some external off offsetting, then Article 6 will really begin to bite. Um, it will need to be rigorous, robust, and net zero aligned, not to borrow, to borrow a phrase, in order to deliver. I think that's probably not where we're likely to get at ASAP, but it's going to be really important that the outcome in Glasgow next year doesn't give us a weak standard there that's going to undermine that kind of um, net zero alignment once we get to the middle part of this century. Great, thanks, Tom. Um, so a question maybe for Steve or Eli. I think this is this is reiterating something we've, I think, made quite clear in the principles, which is from Charlie Chronic from Greenpeace UK, who is asking, um, are there limits to offsetting? Um, should we not, should, sh surely they should be reserved for hard to abate sectors? Do you want to elaborate or answer that, elaborate on it? Yeah, I mean, we largely agree, and I think that's in principle one. So I hope that comes through loud and clear. I think the only thing that I would just add to it, uh, I think it is a valid point. Um, we, we don't say anything in the document about how big we think the carbon offset market should be. So please don't read this as us saying it needs to get bigger or it should be any kind of certain size. What we're drawing attention to is um, to the extent that offsets are needed in future, and certainly it looks on the face of it at the moment like you know there will be some kind of offset market given the number of people who are talking about it. Here's what the portfolio should look like, and it's quite different to what the portfolio looks like now. Um, but we underline again principle one that those offsets that are used and need to be very high quality and actually before you think about offsets you really need to deal with those emissions which which is at all possible to, to deal with now and keep revisiting things as innovations and behaviors change over time and and in all honesty uh, emissions reduction should get easier over time. Just to add briefly to that there's another way of interpreting Charlie's question which is really who gets to use which offsets? Because I think we can actually think of the pool of available offsets, whether it's reductions or removals, as themselves being a limited resource in the same way that you know, fossil fuels are a depletable resource. And I think when we think about that, and this gets back to the question that was asked previously about risk, we do have to be a bit concerned about you know, which actors are, are going to successfully stock up on very, very inexpensive, often very low quality offsets now, kind of check that box, get credit for having achieved net zero, and then leave the rest of us only with the more expensive op options. And so I think when we think about um, 
I, I'm, I apologize, and now I'm, now I'm kind of starting to answer the risk question, but when we think about what's an appropriate level of risk, what's, what's an appropriately low level of risk of reversal for a carbon benefit that's been achieved, I think the answer is to tie it, to, to take it away from the uh, Yadvinder and Miles uh, negotiating over centuries, if we take it down to sort of the corporate way of thinking, the appropriate level of risk is however much risk a, a CFO is willing to take to, to say with a straight face that the offsets they've purchased are actually you know, permanent uh, uh, carbon benefits to the atmosphere. And there's some corporations who's gonna, who are gonna have a much lower threshold than others for that. So I just sort of caution um, all actors, you know, the ENGOs, um, everyone, that we don't sort of play into the hands of certain industries who will go unnamed, who are right now in the midst of making a massive pivot in terms of their business model. I mean, there's been some announcements about some of the oil and gas majors launching their own nature-based solution offsetting businesses. And th there's a reason for that. So we just have to be careful that we don't deplete all of the sort of low-hanging fruit, important, uh, cheap, unfortunately, often poorly constrained carbon benefit carbon projects now, leaving us in 10 or, 10 or 15 years only with the more expensive options, which society will have to pay for. Corporations already got off the hook. So um, we're going to be having to wrap up in a sec and, and move on to the third stage of this event. But um, one question I wanted to open up to all of you, see, see who wants to pounce on it. Steve, you, you were saying, you know, we're, we're agnostic about scale, is what you said. And um, I think I, I'm going to press you a bit on that and press the others on it. I mean, how, how, how big do you think this should get? Um, because a lot of people, of course, are thinking about scale. Carney talked about 100 billion per year. I don't know quite how that fits in with what anyone thinks, but and where that number came from. But interested in reactions to that. How big does this need to be? How big should it be? Uh, I would say it's the million dollar question, but that's probably underselling it, isn't it? Um, I, I'm going to sort of take that question and maybe deflect it quite brazenly in a slightly different direction. Um, because I, I, I think I, I really agree with Eli that, that the scale of the market should be determined by how effective and fair it really is. Um, and I think uh, if if we have offsetting markets which people jump into and they prove to be um, very poor quality in terms of their real world impact, confidence will drain out of that market and it won't scale. So there is a virtuous circle to be had in terms of getting this right. Um, but but I think people are rightly concerned. Um, there, there are two classes of concern about offsets. Really, there's a kind of fundamental moral objection you can take to offsetting. You can view it as a sort of Catholic sale of indulgences if you want. Um, but, but the other one is a more pragmatic, well, it doesn't have to be morally wrong, but it just doesn't work. And I think um, there, are, there is scope to use markets to finance a lot of effort, and it doesn't necessarily have to be in the narrow sense of using it for carbon offsets to meet your net zero target. So I think what we can do here is build a framework which not only people may choose in order uh, to use in order to make a net zero claim, but also just as a way of providing finance to projects they think are deserving and not necessarily, and they can avoid perverse incentives of kind of grabbing offsets to meet a net zero target for their shareholders, but they can actually put money into projects they think are deserving and have carbon benefits. So I think that there is a chance for this to scale in a slightly different and uh, more, um, more multifaceted way than carbon offsetting is potentially thought of before. And I hope if we get it right, then it scales for the right reasons because it's actually doing good. Uh, do Yadvinda, Miles, Tom, do you want to add anything briefly on the scale question? I mean, I think it is important to emphasize that, you know, fractionally, it, we know what the answer is in the long term um, because we know what net zero means. Um, you know, for something like aviation, eventually every ton of fossil carbon that aviation dumps into the atmosphere is going to have to get scrubbed out again. Um, so. So we know what scale that particular industry needs to get to in terms of offsetting. Um, of course, we don't know how big that industry will need to be, but to some extent that doesn't really matter if we're looking at you know, what the industry um, is doing in the meantime, um, that sets the, you know, uh, uh, that's basically allows us to evaluate whether they really are on target for a credible net zero or not. Yvinda, Tom, anything else you good? I think, I think that point answers it quite nicely, I think. Just one final point. I think the other aspect of scale we should really be looking at is what is the ratio of the industry's future need for these technologies 
and its current investments in them. Um, and I think we're seeing probably not too many businesses that are putting a lot of uh, advanced research and development uh, resources into the kinds of solutions they'll probably need to rely on at some point. So there's a bit of a, if you will, a um, responsibility gap there. Maybe that's a role for government to play, certainly is a role for government to play in early phase technology development. Um, but it'd be nice to see that scale up at a, in a level and pace commensurate to the expansion of zero targets, because it's going to need to go. Um, you need to start, you should have started a long time ago, and the second best time to start would be right now. Great. Okay. Well, thanks so much um, for all of those, answering all those questions. We're now going to move on to part three. But of course, all of the authors, all of us are very open to continuing the conversation. So please do get in touch. Um, and as you can tell, there are still many things to debate and talk about and think about. Um, so uh, let's move on to the third part. So it's wonderful to welcome Jess, Margaret, Miguel and Lewis. We've got you on. Wonderful. Okay, so I think we have, if, if, if you could give your, I'm going to ask you each to give a brief introduction and, and say a tiny bit about what you think about these questions briefly in a, in a couple of minutes, and then we'll, we'll, we'll move back into a discussion Q&A if that's okay. And um, let's start with Jess first, and then Margaret, then Miguel, then Lewis. Thanks very much. Hi, everyone. I'm Jess Ayres. I'm one of the directors in the climate change team at the Children's Investment Fund Foundation. Um, we massively welcome this work and I think there's real appetite for it. So I've actually just come from a meeting of about 15 corporates, the, the, the guys who we consider at the kind of higher integrity end of the scale, many of whom have, have kind of highly credible net zero transition plans in place. And they want to know how to engage in the voluntary carbon market um, in a way that is legitimate really for, the, for, their, for their net zero plans. And they don't know how to do that. Um, so I think this is this is really welcome, and we are, are looking forward to working with you on um, on kind of how how we can actually operationalise this, how it lines up with with the SBTI and other advice, and how we can turn it into kind of very very practical uh, net zero transition plans um, for companies. I think um, I think the questions that have been asked actually are excellent. So so you know we share. Um, the concerns on how this fits with with the Paris architecture, what this means for global goals for net zero, and um, look forward to diving into some of those issues in the discussion. Great, thanks, Jess. I'm keen also to explore complementary initiatives, yeah. including the one you just mentioned. So, uh, Margaret, over to you. Great, thanks so much, and thanks for including us in the conversation, Ben. I'm uh, Margaret Kulo. I lead WWF's global uh, finance practice. That's our uh, engagement with finance, investment, lending, uh, insurance, all across the sector, across the world. Uh, and obviously, this is a, a very important issue to us as well. Really appreciate the the paper um, because it starts to move the conversation beyond just the scaling, which is clearly important, but also to get to some of the quality issues. Uh, and I uh, have um, lots of thoughts on, uh, on, on how you might amplify the uh, mitigation hierarchy in particular when we get into the conversation and some um, points on uh, quality and then maybe to the, uh, to the removals piece as well, but um, really welcome the initiative. Thank you. Thanks, Margaret. Miguel, over to you. Yes, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I work for the UNFCCC or the UN Climate Change Secretariat, as you want to, to call it. And uh, I lead the Climate Neutral Now initiative, which has a direct linkage with uh, carbon markets. So uh, from, from my side, I think just to say that the, the paper, the principles are, in my opinion, uh, are very sound and they provide some guidance that uh, was lacking in the a voluntary market world and the, it gets uh, or it gives more push to this important discussion about how the carbon markets and the offsetting world uh, should be evolving so uh, i think it's, uh, it's very useful uh, i look forward to, to the discussion to uh, to go into more details and lewis thanks i've been invited i think because uh, we've got uh, a lot of experience in the carbon markets uh, and um, bearing in mind the EU emissions trading scheme, the world's largest, started uh, from scratch with nothing. And in fact, trades took place on that market um, before the uh, legislation was even enforced. And one of the things that um, uh, I, I take away from this 
um, paper is that it's, it's very practical uh, and it's realistic in terms of considering all the different types of offset that are out there and that you can't just uh, throw away uh, what's already been done um, but clearly the longer term target needs to be about those removals and high quality uh, removals and so the overall view we've got of this paper is that it distills the issues uh, very nicely uh, very um, uh, uh, very accurately to allow the debate to move forward uh, constructively and so again uh, we very much look forward to this discussion too Great. Okay. Well, um, let's kick off with some questions. I think one thing um, that's come up again and again and is coming up a lot in the context of this task force on scaling voluntary carbon markets is this tension between, well, I guess it's a question whether it's a tension, I want you to engage with this, integrity and liquidity. Um, and obviously, uh, Carney uh, came out in the FT a couple of days ago talking a lot about liquidity. The task force consultation document talks about liquidity. Um, who wants to engage with with that debate? That feels like a central debate. I mean, Lewis, maybe you should go first because I mean, you, you, you're in the markets. You've been following the markets very closely. Um, okay, yeah, and uh, it's a difficult one. The voluntary markets are uh, uh, requiring or asking uh, corporations that aren't regulated um, in terms of their carbon emissions to to um, uh, well, we're asking those corporations to do something about that, and the voluntary markets are the tool to allow them uh, to do that. Um, but what we've got to face up to is the reality that ultimately the only solution to this problem uh, is going to be direct regulation uh, of uh, any company's carbon emissions, whether direct or indirect. And the reason I say that is because it's, um, uh, it's all very well saying uh, what we all want from the market uh, and we want from the market high quality removals but it is a fact that those high quality removals are more expensive than any of the compliance carbon markets that exist today and so um, the integrity versus liquidity point um, is, is, a, is a really difficult one because on the one hand if you have um, uh, if you have a set of rules and regulations then you will have liquidity uh, because if you have a standardized carbon reduction uh, and you have a uh, demand for that standardized carbon reduction in whatever form it takes, um, then you will have liquidity. And the EU emissions trading scheme, the California scheme and others are, are great examples of that. You've got a set of rules. Everybody knows what's going on. Um, the people that are buying um, uh, want one thing and the people that are selling have that thing for sale. And so the two meet and we, we get liquidity because you have a, um, a very simple uh, concept. You have a ton of carbon that someone wants to buy and a ton of carbon that someone wants to sell. In the case of, uh, in the, case of the voluntary markets, um, we can talk about a ton being a ton being a ton, um, but uh, because they are voluntary, then you end up with a market that uh, becomes uh, split uh, according to uh, different uh, market participants' view of what is a good offset? Um, and some people want offsets at the lowest possible cost. Others want offset with um, the most fantastic SDGs and others, yet others, uh, we had the example of Stripe earlier, want to uh, have carbon removals. And so you end up with a market that is um, so diverse um, that it can't be liquid. Um, but it's not to say that the, some of the lower cost uh, offsets don't have integrity. Um, so, Integrity versus liquidity. Um, I think you either either have legislation, in which case everyone's trading the same thing, uh, in which case that'd be very that'd have high integrity and you'd have a lot of liquidity, um, or you have to accept um, that there is at least um, the desire from the buying part of this community um, to have different types of offset um, for their their specific needs, and, and that's where the, um, the liquidity falls falls down. Miguel, I see you nodding a lot. Do you want to come in on, on this one? I have to nod less. <laughs> no, uh, I, uh, I agree with Louis that uh, the price uh, right now, the current price is not necessarily an indicator of the integrity of the, of the offsets, right? The, the demand right now is very depressed. And even with uh, very high quality projects generating very good offsets, uh, the price is not where, where it should be. 
uh, not where it should be if we really want the price to be a driver of, of uh, emission reduction, right? Um, now, having said that, in terms of the, the liquidity, um, having read the document from the task force, um, there is, I mean, there's, all, there's always this tension, as you said, between uh, trying to ensure the, the environmental integrity of the, of the projects and the offsets that they generate, uh, which requires to follow strict rules, uh, clear, transparent, strict rules and procedures, and uh, generating them at scale. Mm -hmm. So the two are in constant, uh, in constant competition, right? You want a lot, and then you need to do a, a lot of projects that will generate a lot of offsets very quickly that endangers the, the integrity. Um, so there is always this, this tension between the two, the two sides. What the task force I understand is trying to do is set a series of uh, definitions uh, that can be uh, translated into standard contracts that can be offered to the buyers so that the buyer looks at the contract and they know exactly what they are uh, buying uh, transparently. Um, so as long as the, there could be uh, enough trust in, a, in the process that generates a large quantity of offsets right, that are credible and facilitates the purchase, the, the, the buying journey that they call uh, by the purchaser by having standard contracts and standard terminology that makes it very clear what you're getting. I think there's value in doing that. Right now, there is no transparency in the voluntary market. It's very difficult to get information. Uh, you see very, very wide uh, range of prices and you don't know why. So having uh, some standard taxonomy and, um, and documentation that helps you understand what you're getting uh, would make it easier for the buyer and probably encourage more to more uh, entities and more, more participants to to, to buy credit. So I see some, some value in that, as long as the process of generating the offsets remains strong. Great, and, um, and, and audience, please keep the questions coming. Um, now, Margaret, do you wanna, do you wanna go next? Um, I mean, the other thing I wanted to add, uh, to, you know, both, both you and Jess, you know, haven't we all, we've, we've all been here before, haven't we? I mean, what's, I'm kind of interested in how people think this is different, what's changed? Um, so your reflections on that would also be interesting. Yeah, thanks. That, that's an interesting way to uh, to uh, frame it too, because it's um, I, I, for us it starts with the mitigation hierarchy. I know this has come up uh, quite a bit in the chat, and 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 I think that the the authors uh, framed that a little bit better when you did the presentation than it is maybe in the uh, in the principles itself, because I think at the principle level, the um, the mitigation hierarchy needs to be uh, first because we we really need to get to the avoidance uh, and the uh, and the reduction point before we get to the removals point. Um, and and in fact, um, I think most of the 1.5 degree climate scenarios don't see significant scaled removals until about 2040. We need reductions now and avoidance now. So uh, one thing that might be helpful would be to, to pull that out itself as a principle, because there's a little bit of mix in the principles between um, principles and, and some more operational levels or quality, um, quality elements. Uh, and, and, and at the principle level, you've got the mit mitigation hierarchy. And the second principle maybe is, is that they need, if when you get to credits, they need to be of a, of a quality uh, and there are um, efforts to try to get better at defining that quality piece so that you don't um, you don't get you know scaling i think right now the scaling potentially is ahead of the quality piece they both need to come uh, a lot faster but again first we need the uh, avoidance and we need the uh, reduction um, before we get to the um, removals discussion Maybe, maybe 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 one more just a, just a language point because I think this has come up a little bit more in the conversation. Offsets assumes a particular use of the credit, and there's there's at the end of the day what you are talking about is the credit one use of which is for offsetting. But if if you frame the principle 
the principles as a discussion of the offsetting, then uh, you need to really uh, emphasize the point on the mitigation hierarchy because there are other ways that you might use the credits, uh, including for you know individuals who talked a little bit about consumer uh, increasing consumer demand or for companies that aren't of the uh, um, um, high uh, hard to abate sectors that may really still want to be part of the climate solution and are looking for quality credits. Thanks, Margaret. And one, one quick follow-up for you. I'm just you, you, the mitigation hierarchy. You're absolutely right; it's critical. Um, to what extent have you seen that captured in regulation anywhere? I think we're going to see it more and more captured in regulation as countries start to get countries start to get more serious about their um, NDCs and increasing their level of ambition under the NDCs. I think we're already seeing some regulatory moves in the EU in particular, not just on disclosure either, right? We're moving beyond uh, disclosure, I think. And you're also starting to see a bit of, of I don't know if you call it consumer demand, public demand to look under the hood of what these credits are. Um, you know, as they started quite a while ago saying, yes, but you know, we'd, we'd love to buy a carbon credit and you just sort of purchase whatever, whatever is offered if you're flying somewhere. But I think even your sort of mom and pop consumers are starting to look a lot more closely at whether that actually is some sort of a, uh, a benefit to the reduction in uh, climate emissions at the global level. So people are really starting to pay much more attention to the fact that we need to get to a one and a half degree world not just um, uh, sort of move the paper around. Thanks, Margaret. Jess. Thanks, Ben. So to, to come back to your question on, on what's different and haven't we been here before. So, um, so when I think about why we have carbon markets, the, for me, the point of a carbon market is to put a price on carbon to encourage decarbonisation. And I feel like at some point we've lost sight of that. Um, of that North Star. And I think the renewed attention to the voluntary carbon market has come around because there's a huge amount of pressure for corporates to reach net zero and to, to sort of get their, get their back offices in gear. And, um, and the voluntary carbon market is now used as a way to reduce compliance costs. And if, if we take that as given, then scale um, is indeed a real, real barrier um, and, and in direct conflict to integrity. But if we go back to the original North Star, which is actually, you know, we want to put a price on carbon and we want to use carbon markets to reach net zero, then scale doesn't necessarily have to be in conflict with integrity. Um, but I think it comes back to, to two things. One, you know, what Lou was saying about putting some firm rules around this. And I think, uh, I think um, that that uh, that is, is sort of on the radar of the of the Carney task force, but but certainly the kind of the level of detail around process that we that we need probably isn't going to come out of that process, and and we need to to look elsewhere. Um, and then I think the second area that we need to pay really close attention to, which has come up time and time again in this in this meeting, is the interactions between the voluntary carbon market and the Paris architecture. And I do think we need to iron that out, and I do think we need firm rules around, you know, corresponding adjustments in order to make sure that this does all add up to net zero. And at the moment, I think that, you know, we're, we're forging ahead with an ambition of scale um, in, in quite a dangerous way. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I, I'm just to reiterate, please do ask questions. Um, there's one question, a variant of it that's been asked by both Michael Lynch and Courtney from Ceres in the US really around um, kind of, you know, neocolonialism and Western organizations investing in cheap projects overseas and, um, you know, to what extent is that a, a problem um, and what, what do people think about that? Uh, maybe I can, I can go first. Uh, well, from the point of view of the UNFCCC process, um, developing uh, countries, developing country governments have agreed to uh, the use of these cooperative mechanisms since the Kyoto Protocol. So in, in that sense, uh, they have uh, been in agreement of uh, allowing this type of cooperation to happen uh, as a way to encourage investment in, in their countries. And uh, in the process of the CDM in particular, <clears throat> the Clean Development Mechanism, uh, under the Kyoto Protocol, there is a, a clear requirement for any project that is going to generate carbon credits through the mechanism to have first an approval of the national government of the country where, where the project is going to be uh, located. 
So in that sense, it, it, it has been seen as a collaboration between uh, the developed country uh, corporations or uh, other players and the, the developing countries. And one of the big um, uh, reasons for supporting the voluntary carbon market uh, or the rationale uh, continues to be the increased investment in projects that bring sustainable development benefits to, this, uh, to these developing countries. So in that sense, uh, I think that at least under the UNFCC process, uh, the neocolonialism or, or this kind of thought it has been uh, addressed or has been uh, avoided uh, by having these clear uh, rules where the national governments have to first approve any such project. Uh, something like that could continue to, to happen. Great. Uh, does anyone else want to come in on that? That theme? No? Okay, we have a question from, uh, and you can tell I'm now having trouble scanning through all of these questions, um, from Sarah Adams, who is Chief Sustainability Officer at a US-based investment manager, and she's asking, um, uh, you know, should should charities, NGOs who are working on reforestation projects now become carbon market participants, which I think is again is something that has happened in in the past. Um, what do you think about that, Jess, Margaret, Lewis? So I think um, uh, to the extent that uh, an NGO could uh, um, take the revenue from the project that they are working on and use that revenue to do more good, um, then there's certainly scope uh, for participation in carbon markets. Um, if, the, uh, uh, if the NGO's uh, activity, um, which can often be the case, and it was mentioned in the, um, uh, in the principles, if it's doing much more good than just the CO2 reduction, then the contribution that the CO2 part, uh, the, the offset part uh, might make, might be quite small in terms of the overall uh, cost of any given project. Um, one of the, uh, changing the subject slightly, one of the, the problems with the uh, voluntary market is that there is a massive oversupply and there isn't enough demand. And one of the reasons there's not much demand is because there is a distrust creeping in. As Margaret pointed out, that you know, people are starting to ask questions, but when they ask questions of the voluntary market, they, they don't really find answers, they probably just find more questions. Um, as you dig deeper into this thing, it gets really quite complicated. Uh, for example, I, I wouldn't feel comfortable um, uh, uh, telling you for your uh, holiday you're taking um, in the hopefully near future, um, exactly which offset would be appropriate for you to use to, uh, to offset your, your flight CO2 emissions because um, there's so many different types of projects um, and it takes quite a lot of discussion to determine uh, whether it is truly additional, whether it's in the, the right place and it's doing the right thing for the right people. Um, uh, so a lot of um, uh, um, uh, a lot of confusion in the market leads to lower demand or, or causes there to be less demand, um, and that causes the prices to be low. So the long term, um, uh, the long term uh, hope for voluntary markets is that they. Uh, increase in value, incentivize higher quality projects, and we can start to um, forget about uh, uh, um, uh, the, the, the projects with, with less integrity because uh, we can demonstrate that there is demand there for the higher integrity projects and people are willing to pay. Yes. Yeah, um, I think that that reveals a, a bigger question, actually, which is that nature based solutions are really struggling for finance and voluntary carbon markets are seen as the silver bullet. You know, there's so much excitement around around the scale for nature based solutions. And, and I think I, I really strongly agree with the views that you guys put across in your paper, which is, you know, some of this finance can be channels towards credible nature based solutions, but actually it's, it's not the answer. And they I see carbon markets as a very kind of small part of a very big finance stack and we need to work on the rest of the stack and seeing this as a silver bullet is just a massive distraction um distraction to that so so if i were an ngo working you know in the forestry sector doing great work uh you know by all means if you think it's worth it but i think actually you should be putting pressure on on governments on the private sector and on the rest of us to to think of better solutions yeah pretty good point margaret look, looks like you wanted to come in 
Well, I just just to say that in in as much as there is scale in the space, you know, I I agree with Jess's point on that. And in in as much as there is scale in the space, it's it's definitely in the red space and the and and the forest just because of the um, volume of land cover. Um, so I think it, 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 if you're already in that space, thinking about that space, there is uh, in, important areas to focus where there are opportunities for greater impact. And again, you know, like the mitigation hierarchy, you know, more effort to stop deforestation and forest degradation in the first place uh, really would have a, a, a significant impact. Great. All right. So uh, the, the pace of questions has slowed down slightly. So come on, if you're, if you're in the audience, do ask questions. Um, but I get to ask a question then. Um, so you've read the principles. You've obviously um, you've got you've heard the presentation. Um, you've heard some answers to questions. What do you think the biggest barriers are to implementing the principles? Who wants to have a crack at that? Can I just a just a thought that I had of listening to the the author's presentation in the the last panel as well. Um, it strikes me there are multiple audiences that the paper speaks to, uh, and um, you know, is it is it it could be governments, it could be you know NGOs in the space, it could be funders, it could be uh, corporates, um, and the barriers to implementation uh, really depend on uh, who the audience is, is, who you're who you're thinking of. So I think that that might be one piece of advice back to the. Um, uh, or feedback back to the authors is to to think again about what you know who who's the main user of this and it, it, and then work back from who we think the main user is to which elements need to be highlighted or, or beefed up uh, and then it also helps you identify what the main barriers uh, to usage are I think just in general um, the point that was raised earlier about the lack of standards is a is a real barrier um, there's clearly, demand to uh, purchase credits and now there's concern about whether those credits matter or not in the context of what looks what appears to be and is in some places a rapidly changing regulatory um, uh, uh, market around the emissions in the first place uh, and then the uh, relationship to the NDCs and delivery of the Paris Agreement in general. So I think that kind of uncertainty just in general is always a, a problem for uh, moving a market quickly. Um, I think the, the biggest barrier is straightforward is the cost. I mean, we want to have removals and we want to have long term removals, but they're expensive. Um, and the, yeah, the, the, the EU ETS today, the price closed just south of um, 31 euros. So that's you know, about $35. And if, um, uh, if corporates were um, hoping to make carbon neutral claims, uh, but had to ship in carbon credits at $35 a ton, it's very unlikely there'd be very many of them doing that. Um, and, the, and the second point is the messaging around um, uh, the, the journey to net zero. So, for example, uh, if everybody wants to be carbon neutral today, well, they can't be because someone's got to do the um, uh, offsetting and reduce their emissions against business as usual, but still emit. Um, uh, so there's a limited supply of these things. But um, uh, the idea that companies should be carbon neutral today, uh, as opposed to making uh, increasingly large reductions over time, um, uh, it, 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 it can't happen. Right? Um, and if it, if it were to happen, the price would have to be $100 a tonne. And that's not going to be voluntarily done. However, if, if you said to companies, right, well, you have to reduce your emissions by, say, 10% um, uh, on a glide path to net zero by 2050, then the cost um, is much, much smaller. So if it were um, uh, um, in the case of the EU ETS, where it's $35 a tonne, um, uh, the true cost would be uh, over your total emissions, because bearing in mind companies are reducing 100% emissions to make a carbon neutral claim, the cost over your total emissions is, is would be three and a half dollars a ton. Right? So you need to have a high price, um, otherwise you can't have the removals, um, but you can't have a high price because people want to make a carbon neutral claim on 100% of their emissions, whereas actually the glide path, the science-based targets type approach um, is the more appropriate way 
Uh, and bearing in mind, um, not everyone can be 100% carbon neutral anyway. Um, we're sort of, um, uh, uh, we're destined to fail um, if we want to solve this problem through the voluntary market. Miguel, did you want to come in? Thanks, yes, yes. Uh, maybe I just wanted to raise one point that may be uh, related, but it's not a direct answer to, to the question. And it's, uh, you may be aware of this uh, net zero initiative by Carbon4, uh, Carbon Carbon4 in, in France. They are looking at the offsets or the carbon market, uh, not as a way to arrive at a carbon neutrality claim, uh, which has a value, right? The, the carbon neutrality claim mainly uh, the value that it has is that it encourages organizations to uh, to invest in these uh, in these projects in the in the market, so they can have some uh, some brand value from from it, right? Being able to say I'm carbon neutral. Uh, but in reality, when you say I'm carbon neutral, your emissions, as Louis was saying, uh, they they have not been destroyed, they have not been removed uh, or captured. They're still out there, right? So uh, you still had an impact on on climate. Um, so as Related to what Jess was saying, a net zero initiative is looking at um, using offsets or projects from the carbon markets as a contribution to move towards net zero. So you don't make necessarily the claim, I bought these offsets to compensate my emissions and say I'm neutral, but to uh, support emission reductions or avoidance capture, temporary or long-term capture, beyond my value chain. So you can see the contribution by corporates in different areas. I reduce my own emissions. I work along my client, my supply chain to, re chain, sorry, to reduce emissions there. And then I look beyond my, uh, my supply chain. So in that sense, it, we, we could avoid a little bit this discussion about is it uh, really um, valid to say I'm carbon neutral or not? Uh, you, you may forget about the claim uh, to carbon neutrality and simply refer to different ways to contribute to support climate action by different stakeholders in your, in, in your network and beyond it. Um, yeah, and then just one last comment to respond to, to, to Louis' point. I think the carbon markets are not supposed to solve the whole problem. The carbon markets are just supposed to be one of many different tools that we need to, or that we can use to, uh, I believe we need to, uh, used to uh, drive emission reductions faster, but definitely the carbon market is not is no silver bullet. It's not going to solve the, the whole issue. It's supposed to just uh, contribute uh, one part, hopefully a significant one, but just one part of the of the solution. Great, thanks, Miguel. Jess, could I ask you to maybe well come in on that, but also say a bit more about your work on the demand side to take that. Yeah, sure. So, so the two are very related. So as I said, I just came from, from a meeting with um, some corporates asking the question, what would it take um, for you guys to engage in a, in a net zero carbon offset market? And what, what are the barriers and the, the challenges they came up with are very clear um, and, not, and not surprising. So one was complexity. You know, this is hugely complicated. Uh, nobody understands carbon accounting apart from very few experts. Very easy to, to hoodwink people. People don't know how to go to their CEOs to, to say, I want to spend 50 quid a ton on, on high quality emissions and, and their CEOs would turn around them and say, why? So that's that's one issue. The second issue is controversy. Um, you know, we are very ideological in this, in this space and very divided, I think, as civil society. And I think that leaves um, corporates who have genuinely good intentions feeling very exposed. Um, and so one of the things that we are trying to do at CIF is to actually have a very practical conversation around, okay, what does credible, legitimate net zero offsetting look like? And I think that the Oxford principles are hugely helpful in this regard. And then can we build a coalition of high integrity corporates who can sign, sign on to that? And can we, can we get some government backing for that? Can we get civil society agreement for that? And can we start to put some governance around it so that we can sort of showcase the leaders in this space and actually try and create a bit of a market for it? Now we know um, that at first it's not going to be very many actors who are willing to sign up to that, but we want to showcase uh, a few and get this off the ground. And we know also that over, you know we will have to have um, sector-wide offset, offsetting transition plans, exactly as the um, exactly as the principles set out. And this will all be this will all be part of that. But I, I think we want to bring you know we want there needs to be a kind of one-stop shop to answer corporates' concerns on how they can credibly use offsetting. And I think um, 
it will be at first quite exclusive because as I say, there aren't that many, uh, there aren't that many companies who are going to sign up to something like this because it will be initially quite expensive and there will be huge limits on the kinds of claims that they can make. Um, but it has to be, you know, I, I think it has to exist. Otherwise, you know, the risks, um, the risks are just too, the risks are just too big. Uh, so we've just kicked this off with a couple of uh, a couple of meetings this week. One with you know a set of corporates, one with a set of uh, civil society actors working in this space. We think we found some kind of common ground. We hope to launch it in the next couple of weeks. We hope to get um, some UK government backing, probably possibly in the new year. Um, we don't think that this directly conflicts with the Carney Initiative. We think we are a kind of landing ground for issues that they are that are simply just out of scope for them. So we we hope that the two can run side by side. Um, but if anyone's interested, I can put my details in the chat. Please do follow up. Great, thanks, Jess. We've, we've also got a question here from Maria about um, SBTI, Science-Based Targets Initiative, um, and other corporate setting targets. Um, how do people, what do people think about that? And how does offsets fit into that? Margaret? Yeah, I'll take, yeah I, I was going to come in on that. And, um, thanks to Lewis for uh, mentioning that as well. I think, uh, you know, the, this, this gets to the credibility of the target setting itself. So before the corporate gets to the carbon credits, they have to make sure that their, their glide path, if you want to think about it that way, their target setting methodology and approach is science-based. And, and we do have a way to do that now through the science-based targets initiative. So uh, they, they need to start there. Um, make sure that they've got a credible approach to the avoidance and the mitigation, you know, a, a, a look really at the transition of the business model first, uh, and then the discussion of the carbon credits comes uh, next. So start with the science-based target setting. Yeah, and, and there's a really good question here from Nicola Steen, um, and she's asking, um, don't we need to be careful not to undermine existing standards? Companies are already confused. Um, could this not be seen to be undermining existing standards like the gold standard? What do you think? Or maybe, I mean, to a degree, maybe that's part, part of the point. I don't know. Um, thoughts? So I, th I think existing standards need to be tested because I think some of them are excellent and some of them which appear to be excellent, actually there's, there is quite a lot of dross included. So I think we do need to test existing standards. You know, we, we speak to gold standard a lot. I think they are fantastic, but, um, you know, I think they would, every, everybody would admit that nobody is perfect. And I think that the more attention there is to scaling the voluntary carbon market, the greater the risk that standards uh, who are policing themselves um, could, could, could become, um, should we say, not, not as unimpeachable as we would hope, hope that they would be. If I may, yes, I don't think the, the principles uh, would damage any existing standard, but they actually are an encouragement to, to, uh, to improve, right? And at the standards, they have to evolve. They have to continue evolving as the reality changes. Uh, so this is more an encouragement to, to look beyond where they, where they are potentially, where they are right now. So I wouldn't see uh, wouldn't see them as a threat, but rather as an opportunity. Yeah, I mean, so I mean, what? what yeah, there's lots of strands here. Um, one strand of criticism has been um, that maybe all this work on on offsets and on principles is, um, yeah, the the indulgences argument. I mean, there's a sort of a a body of thought there in civil society that this is enabling um, the status quo and is and is not supporting the transition. Do you do you is there a point where you you start to agree with that argument? Have we reached that point? What do you think? Yeah, I think if if you if you consider twenty fifty when uh, we will have net zero emissions in the UK, uh, Europe, uh, now the US. Um, and a number of other countries. Um, the, um, when we talk about net zero, we're talking about some people emitting, uh, such as uh, airlines burning fossil fuel because the alternative um, isn't uh, viable. Maybe it is in 2050, but you know, as things stand, it isn't. Um, and someone having to uh, capture carbon and, and, and store it underground right, to compensate for that. So the idea that you're um, uh, buying an indulgence in that scenario, it, it it's not appropriate because you are doing some damage and uh, with the uh, to the environment with the uh, with the aircraft 
and you are um, fixing the problem, undoing that damage by taking the CO2 back out of the atmosphere and putting it underground where it isn't going to come back. Um, so I think it's a, uh, an, uh, uh, an unfair comparison in that scenario. Uh, clearly, if uh, uh, people, companies, um, governments um, think that it's okay to uh, buy a low quality offset and uh, uh, continue to uh, pollute or indeed to increase levels of pollution, well then that's most certainly um, the wrong outcome. So it's uh, a difficult question to answer um, uh, unless you start to then drill down into the detail of the situation. Okay, um, and a final question for you all, each of you, if you could try and answer this. And um, yeah, I mean, we've, as, as I was sort of alluding to, and we talked about, we've kind of gone through this before. What's your honest assessment about whether we can realize the potential of carbon markets and offsets in, you know, and, and, and we'll have to do that fairly soon. Do you think this current effort will actually yield the results that we, we need it to yield? Maybe starting with Jess and then Margaret and then Miguel and then Lewis. I think it depends what you mean by by results and scale. You know, are we looking to kind of maximize the the um, the, the the money spent in in offsetting markets, or or is is there real potential to get them to reach net zero? So I would focus on the latter. Um, I think you know that, as I said before, that has to be our north star, and I think that we. We can get there. I think, you know, these principles and, and SBTI guidance is a real start, but I think we need to keep the pressure up on corporates to, to see offsets as not an excuse not to decarbonize, but um, as, as, uh, as necessary on their, um, on their pathway to neutralizing some of their emissions. And when, we, when, when they get to what they, what they genuinely cannot, the emissions they can, genuinely cannot abate, then, they are, then they're a really uh, great opportunity for compensation. Um, I think it's possible but i think we are at a point in time that's very high risk so i think it's it's really important that we're having this conversation all right margaret yeah i i think the i think the regulatory pressure is really going to come on full on strong in the next uh, year or two uh, and there's there's not going to be a lot of choice in terms of the decarbonization because the uh, there is growing realization, I would say, in all sectors that we, we have to get to one and a half degrees. And it, how do you get to one and a half degrees? You need a combination of avoidance, you need mitigation, you need transition, you're going to need a whole set of tools, financial and otherwise, in order to get there. So I think putting the principles in place now, working really hard on the quality now, trying to develop the market now, so that it's in place when the regulatory hammer hits, uh, it, it has the potential to move a little bit more quickly. But I would say corporates should really, really be paying attention to what regulators are saying. Thanks. I, I completely agree with, with Jess and, and with, um, with Margaret. I think uh, the, the potential is there to, to really use the market as a, as a tool to help decarbonize. And uh, how the market works, what exactly the market is, is providing you with needs to evolve with time. Uh, the principles provide a very good guidance on where the, the evolution should go. And I'm sure that in the near future, we will have new ideas and new uh, new needs that will need to be incorporated into these principles and, and, and the operation of the markets. But right now, when there is a very, very big opportunity to use the markets as an effective tool. Uh, the, we do need the, the robust and uh, transparent rules, uh, but uh, that the, the fact that we don't have all the answers today shouldn't be a reason for not trying to do it right. Um, so again, this conversation is, is very important to try to, to get there. Um, I think we're surfing a bit of a wave of goodwill at the moment and the risk um, is that uh, when the rubber hits the road uh, and uh, uh, corporates face up to the cost of carbon removals, they're going to balk at that cost. Um, uh, so therefore, and the reason for that is because uh, one corporate that um, engages with uh, neutralizing its carbon footprint at a very high price makes itself uncompetitive to another corporate that doesn't. Um, and if that wave of goodwill goes away, then one of those corporates will back out. Um, uh, and ultimately, regulation uh, of this uh, of carbon emissions is the only uh, only sensible uh, uh, answer to the problem. 
and, and that's because uh, there's uh, a lot of companies in the EU ETS and other emissions trading schemes around the world um, and they're paying uh, $35 through gritted teeth uh, and yet the cost um, and, they, and they do that because they have to otherwise they face a fine um, uh, and that cost is too high for those um, that are or a lot of those companies feel it's too high even though all of their competitors are facing the same cost um, and in a situation where you don't have to do something i.e a voluntary market um, i can't imagine um, and we you know we deal with uh, corporates around the world that are interested in neutralizing their carbon footprints uh, on a daily basis and i honestly can't imagine that they're going to be very happy about paying 50 dollars a ton i think they just won't get involved in the market at all when it gets to that sort of level other than maybe a few exceptional uh, companies with high revenue and low carbon footprints. So I quite like Margaret's point of view, uh, which is uh, use this um, momentum we've got at the moment to build the capacity. Uh, uh, and then when the regulation kicks in, it'll be a lot easier uh, to um, meet the targets than if we don't, um, uh, if we don't have the markets engaging um, uh, now. Yeah. Great. So, so much of this, as all the panelists said, is about standards, shaping standards, and that's certainly why, why we produce the principles. But thank you, Jess. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you, Miguel and Lewis, for participating in, in that part of the session. So we're now out of time. Um, on behalf of all the co-authors, thank you so much for participating. We had great levels of participation. This is obviously be recorded and will be available soon. So if you missed bits of it, you can catch up um, or you can circulate it to colleagues. Please do. And please do engage with all of us at Oxford on this important question. Um, lots, lots of us, lots of things to uh, think about and address in, in a relatively short space of time. Um, so thanks again, and I hope you have a good rest of the week. Thanks, guys.